The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to St. John. Now a man was ill, Lazarus from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who had anointed the Lord with perfumed oil and dried his feet with her hair. It was her brother Lazarus who was ill. So the sisters sent word to Jesus saying, Master, the one you love is ill. When Jesus heard this, he said, This illness is not to end in death, but is for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was ill, he remained for two days in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to his disciples, let us go back to Judea. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just trying to stone you, and you want to go back there? Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours in a day? If one walks during the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if one walks at night, he stumbles, because the light is not in him. He said this and then told them, Our friend Lazarus is asleep, but I am going to awaken him. So the disciples said to him, Master, if he is asleep, he will be saved. But Jesus was talking about his death. Well, they thought that he meant ordinary sleep. So then Jesus said to them clearly, Lazarus has died. And I am glad for you that I was not there, that you may believe. Let us go to him. So Thomas, called Didymus, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go to die with him. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, only about two miles away. And many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them about their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went to meet him, but Mary sat at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise. Martha said to him, I know he will rise in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus told her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, even if he dies, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord. I have come to believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, the one who is coming into the world. When she had said this, she went and called her sister Mary secretly, saying, The teacher is here and is asking for you. As soon as she heard this, she rose quickly and went to him. For Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still where Martha had met him. So when the Jews who were with her in the house comforting her saw Mary get up quickly and go out, they followed her, presuming that she was going to the tomb to weep there. When Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come with her weeping, he became perturbed and deeply troubled and said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Sir, come and see. And Jesus wept. So the Jews said, See how he loved him. But some of them said, could not the one who opened the eyes of the blind man have done something so that this man would not have died? So Jesus, perturbed again, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay across it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the dead man's sister, said to him, Lord, by now there will be a stench. 
He has been dead for four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus raised his eyes and said, Father, I thank you for hearing me. I know that you always hear me, but because of the crowd here I have said this, that they may believe that you sent me. And when he had said this, he cried out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, tied hand and foot with burial bands, and his face was wrapped in a cloth. So Jesus said to them, Untie him and let him go. Now many of the Jews who had come to Mary and seen what he had done began to believe in him. The Gospel of the Lord. <coughs> First of all, I want to take a moment to welcome a group of students from the Methodist Church who are visiting us today. I'm not exactly sure where you are, but this is, oh, there they are. So they're part of, it's part of their confirmation prep program. So they'll be joining us for our pancake breakfast afterwards, and then I'll talk to them a little bit about the peculiarities of Catholicism. But anyway, we're very happy to have you all here. And you've picked an interesting time because this Sunday we begin what is officially called Passion Tide. That's why the statues, the crucifixes, and so on are covered in purple. It's this idea that Jesus has gone into hiding. And we begin this intense preparation now for not only Holy Week, but then also the celebration of Easter. But with that in mind, consider our gospel today. Have you ever asked the question, why, of God? Why, Lord? Why, Lord, did this happen? I have in my own life. Circumstances occur, and we ask, why, Lord? Why did this happen? Didn't Martha really ask that when she said to Jesus, Lord, if you had only been here, my brother would not have died? Wasn't she really saying, Lord, if you would have come right away, why didn't you come? Why, Lord, didn't you just give a command and say, Lazarus, be cured, like you did when the centurion asked you for a cure for your serving boy? Well, we don't know the answers to the why. Poor little human beings that we are, simple creatures of Almighty God, will never fully understand the ways of God. But we don't stop there, because if we try to really just stop there, maybe even try to wrestle with that why, we could, and maybe we've known people who have, become very frustrated, angry, even give in to despair, reject God altogether. Instead, we believe. Notice, when Jesus finally arrives, he says to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he should die, will have everlasting life. Do you believe this? Jesus isn't simply saying, Martha, do you understand? No, he says, do you believe? And she says, yes, I believe that you are the Son of God, the Christ who has come into this world. Well, that's the basic statement of faith, and that's why, especially during this time of Passion Tide, you and I have to search our souls and really ask ourselves, do I believe in who Christ is? That he truly is the Lord and Savior who has come into this world. With that profession of faith, though, we are assured of two foundational principles. First, God loves us. God truly loves each one of us here. He made us in his image and likeness. We're far beyond anything else that's been created, far above animals, plants, whatever. God made us in his image and likeness. Moreover, even though Adam and Eve sinned, sin continued to grow in this world, we have sinned. As we read in the gospel, God so loved us 
he gave us his only Son, not to condemn us, but to give us everlasting life. So God truly loves each one of us so much that the Father sent his Son into this world. The Gospel, again, affirms, remember, Jesus in the Gospel loved Lazarus, Martha, and Mary. But then that leads us to the second foundational principle, and that is somehow in God's plan, everything works out for good. Notice what Jesus says when he hears of his friend Lazarus being sick. This illness is not to end in death, but is for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. God's glory will always shine forth. Now, yes, Jesus performs this miracle, and this miracle is very important because it's the last miracle that our Lord performs before he goes to the cross. So already he's performed miracles like curing the paralytic, the blind man, as we heard in last week's gospel. He's multiplied the loaves and the fish, changed water into wine at the wedding feast of Cana. He's calmed a storm. He's exercised demons. But now there's the final enemy, death itself. In all of those miracles, our dear Lord has shown that he truly is the divine Messiah, that he is true God who has power over all things. Now he confronts death itself. So yes, he raises Lazarus back to life. Keep in mind though, Jesus does this to show he has this divine authority. After all, Lazarus will eventually die again. But this does set the stage, being the last miracle, for the greatest action of God that's going to occur. And that is, our dear Lord is going to go to that cross. He, as priest, offers himself for the sacrifice for forgiveness of our own sins. He, by his blood, forgives those sins and reconciles us to the Father. Jesus dies, but on Easter, our Lord rises triumphantly in glory. He has conquered not just sin and suffering, he has conquered death itself. So for those who believe in him, what a great gift of faith to know. Not only is he present in our lives now, but also he is leading us safely on a journey through this life to everlasting life. So my brothers and sisters, we have to always remember those two basic points, that having believed in who Christ is, God loves us, and if we love God, as St. Paul said, everything works out for good. This is important because poor human beings that we are, we face circumstances in this life that could challenge our faith, where we're left asking, why? Why, Lord? But we always remember those two basic principles. For instance, we know in our life here on this planet, we face natural disasters. Creation is sort of ongoing. We have constructive forces, we have destructive forces. Just like we see things blooming right now, we know there are also tornadoes, earthquakes, and the like. Who would have thought that last week there would have been that awful mudslide in Washington State, taking the lives of over 30? Or the earthquake in California, injuring so many? Who would have thought? All we could hope, though, is that they were prepared to leave this life if they died to face our Lord. But doesn't this work out for good also? It reminds us how precious life is. We also see the response of so many people who help assist those who've suffered these circumstances. We see a generosity of spirit. That gives glory to God. Or even the personal faith. I remember a year ago, there were all those awful tornadoes in Oklahoma. This one lady, she was in her early 90s, was interviewed on ABC News, and she said, this is the second time this has happened to me. Years ago, I lost a house because of a tornado, and now 
It's happened again, but God will get me through it. Isn't that a great testimony of faith for someone who's 90 years old? God will get me through this. That's the faith we need to have, and that's what gives glory to God. But then, too, we also face the moral evils. Because God loved us, he gave us a soul with a free will and an intellect, so God allows us to choose to love him, to love him and then to follow what is true and good in his eyes, or to reject him and follow what is evil and false in his eyes, to sin. And we see people who follow what is evil. Who would have thought that again this week we have that awful shooting at Fort Hood, a repeat of something a few years earlier, a couple of weeks ago a shooting at the Norfolk Naval Base. When we watch the news, it's not un uncommon anymore to hear of shootings in grade schools, high schools, movie theaters, shopping malls, and so on. And we have to just wonder what motivates a person to do such a thing. Perhaps some people will say, well, why God? Why God did you allow this to happen? God gave us a free will. People choose. Again, we hope and pray that anyone who lost life was ready to face our Lord. But also, hopefully, those of us here left behind take matters into hand and do something good that gives glory to God, like better care for our wounded soldiers, not just physically, mentally too. Better laws that protect us from people who just misuse firearms. Or perhaps more restrictions on the entertainment industry that seems to be bent on conditioning our children through video games, whatever, to be violent and think nothing of the sanctity of life. So we need to do something positive with us cooperating, God can always bring good out of such evil. But then, too, we even face the circumstances of our own lives. Some of us here know what it is to have the financial disaster, or maybe it's the medical problem, face the death of someone we love. At times, we may ask why. But again, God will bring goodness out of it if we believe. I know a family years ago, they spent their whole life building a business, and they had a family, but really not much love in the marriage or the family, all about making money. And they had everything. They had everything anyone could possibly want. But the economy turned and disaster struck. They lost everything. They had to regroup. And they found a renewed love in their marriage, in their family, and they really realized what was important. That was a great blessing to them. Or I know a man years ago, his name was Ron, this was in my other parish. He called up one day and he said, I'm dying. So I went to see him. He's dying of AIDS. He had left his wife, left his kids, turned to a sinful lifestyle, and was now dying of AIDS. Well, over the course of several months, he was reconciled to the church, to his wife, to his kids, and he died a peaceful death. God's glory shone through that man. So yes, we have to look at the circumstances of our life. And even though, like poor Martha, we may ask, why, Lord? With that deep faith, God loves us. We can rest assured things will work out for good. After all, my brothers and sisters, if we really are honest, would we be better off if life were just paradise? I don't think so. Because if everything was just wonderful, we had everything that we ever needed, and there was no suffering, you and I could easily think, who needs God? We wouldn't bother praying or worshiping. We have everything we want. And we could start thinking, I'm in control. I have my kingdom. I'll decide what's right or wrong. I can be God. That's what Adam and Eve did, and they lost paradise. But even in our first passage from Ezekiel, we're taken back to a time when Israel was a great nation, 
about 600 years before our Lord. They had everything. They had the great economy, they had the king, they had the military might, and so on, and they forgot the covenant, broke the commandments, turned to false gods. God loved them and sent Ezekiel, Jeremiah, and others, and said, repent or destruction's going to come, and they said, oh, forget that, we're happy. Destruction came. The Babylonians came down, destroyed Jerusalem, destroyed the temple, massacred the army, exiled the nobility, and then finally they said, we need God again. So yes, we wouldn't be better off if life were just so comfortable and easy, would we? But because we are loved, God does send us the challenges. And that does make us remember, we need God, we're just little creatures, we are dependent, not independent, we're living better lives if we follow God's way because that will bring us real joy. And when circumstances come, it's time to reevaluate. I wonder, did Lazarus change his life when he came back to life? I would think so. I would. Maybe Lazarus thought, I really need to pray more. I need to spend more time with my loved ones, Martha and Mary. I need to stop sweating over all the little stuffs that cause such frustration in my life. I really need to really enjoy life at the present moment and live life with God. Isn't that the way we should live if we really believe and love God? So my brothers and sisters, St. Paul asks us to live in the spirit, not the flesh, the spirit. And that means to recognize not only how much God loves us, that everything works out for good, but also to live a life with our Savior because he is that good shepherd. And as we walk through this life, he does give us compassion from the Latin compatior, to suffer with. He suffers with us. We're never alone. He does give us confidence, com fide, which is with faith, with trust, so we can always trust in him. He does give us comfort, come fortis, to be filled with strength and encouragement. He gives us that. So never should we just be in darkness wondering why, but remembering God loves us, things will work out for good, and our Savior is always with us. St. Teresa, the great mystic of, the, of Spain, St. Teresa of Avila, simply said this, let nothing trouble you, let nothing frighten you. Everything passes, but God never changes. Patience obtains all. Whoever has God wants for nothing. God alone is enough. Isn't that really our Easter faith? May God bless you.